Good afternoon and welcome to our third day of the Caregiver Training Camp. My name is Rob Fabian. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications for Age of Central Texas. We are a regional nonprofit organization that serves older adults and family caregivers just like yourself. And we are so glad that you're joining us today because we have another wonderful presentation. And today we're going to talk about all of those things that we as caregivers end up having to do, but nobody ever teaches us to do. And we're going to learn today how we as caregivers can safely provide care without injuring ourselves or how without injuring the person that we care for. Before we get started, I've got a very quick video we want to show. We are very grateful to Baylor Scott and White Health for being our presenting sponsor this year. And so I've got a real quick video from them that I want to share with you. Hello, my name is Dr. Sadir Shinoy, and I'm an ophthalmologist here at Baylor Scott and White. With so much technology at the palm of our hands, we've been spending a lot of time on screens. Whether it's for a job, a hobby, or for scrolling through social media, your eyes can feel the impact. I'm here to give you some tips. Humans normally blink about 15 times per minute, but when we look at a computer, it goes down to only five to seven times a minute. Try to remind yourself to blink more often. You can also try artificial tears or put a humidifier in your room. This can especially be helpful during the winter time when the heater is on and the humidity is lower in the house. When you stare at a computer or read a book for an extended period of time, you can strain your eyes. Try the 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break and focus on something at least 20 feet or further away. Adjust your screen brightness to match the level of light around you in order to reduce the amount of work your eyes have to do. You can also increase the contrast on your screen. Try adjusting your position. Sit about arm's length away from the screen and position it so your eyes gaze slightly downward. There is no evidence that light from a computer screen is damaging to your eyes. Blue light blocking glasses are not necessary. But ultraviolet light from the sun can damage your eyes and cause cataracts, pterygiums, or cancer. If you have any questions about your eye or your eye health, please contact your doctor. All right. We once again want to say thank you to Baylor Scott and White Health for being our sponsor for this entire week of presentations. And a couple of real quick housekeeping items. We have four days worth of presentations and we are recording all four of those. So if for any reason today you get knocked off of this video or you missed one of the ones that we've already presented or you might not be able to join us tomorrow, don't worry because they're recorded, we're going to be placing them on our YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch them at any time. At the end of our conference, we're going to send you a link to all four of those videos, so you'll have those to access. We're also going to resend to you our program, all of the caregiver resources, and all the materials that went out for the beginning of the conference. When you get those, be sure and take a look at the program because not only does it have information about all of our speakers, but it also has some great information from all of our sponsors, and we're very grateful for their support. We're also going to send you some caregiver resources that has a lot of really fantastic information in there. And of course, we'll send you the caregiver playbook, which is what we're going to do tomorrow. We also want to send you a survey at the end of the conference. So we ask that you take just a couple of minutes to complete that. You can do it virtually, um, do it online. And again, it only takes about two minutes, but it helps us a lot because these programs, these resources, these seminars, these conferences, we're doing them for you. This is your chance to learn from the experts. So tell us what are some of the topics that you need in your caregiver journey so that when we start planning for our next conferences, we can find speakers to address the subjects that are most affecting you. Finally, during today's presentation, we want you to ask questions. We've got Dr. Amy Walters here. This is your opportunity to have all those questions answered by the expert. So right down here on your screen, you've got a chat feature. It looks like a thought bubble like you see in the comic strips. 
click on that and it'll open up the chat box and want you to type in your questions while Dr. Walters is presenting. Then at the end of our session today, we will go answer all of your questions. Now we do have a little bit of a time restriction. We said that we were only going to go for an hour and a half and we are going to respect your time. So if for some reason we run out of time to answering all the questions, don't worry we're still going to answer your question. We will send you a direct email and we'll answer your question directly. But remember, this is your opportunity. So ask those questions in the chat box so that we can answer them while we have Dr. Walters with us. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy Walters. She is uh, the professor of pharmacology and geriatric physical therapy at the University of St. Augustine here in Austin, Texas. She graduated from the University of Texas with a degree in psychology, and she went to physical therapy school at the University of Texas medical branch in Galveston. She's had quite an extensive career working with outpatient orthopedics. She's taught education classes across the U.S and is able to integrate yoga and Pilates into rehabilitation programming. She is a, just a wealth of knowledge, and we are so grateful to have her with us. Dr. Walters, I am going to turn it over to you, and we thank you once again for joining us and being a part of our conference today. Thank you, Rob. It's good to be here. Um, How's everybody doing getting used to our, our virtual world that we're living in now? It's, um, it's quite an adjustment. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen and then if you guys can let me know if there's any problems seeing it. Okay, can, can you see that Rob? Can you let me know if you can see that and hear me all right? We can see it and we can hear you perfectly. All right, perfect. And I'll give you guys a heads up. Um, I had I, I'd like to incorporate my students into this experience. And since it's virtual and we couldn't do this in person, I instead had them make some videos. So um, we have some some cute videos that they made for you guys, but they're really hard to hear. So what I'm going to do is just um, kind of describe what they're doing in the videos. So you won't be able to hear what they're saying, but I'm going to kind of talk you through it. So just to give you a heads up on that. Um, but I did put their names on here because I appreciate them making these videos to try to make this a little bit more more visual and a little more interactive. Um, as Rob was saying, I'm a physical therapist and a, and a professor at the University of St. Augustine. Um, we're a private physical therapy school down in Southwest Austin. We're tucked away, so a lot of people don't even know we exist. Um, I teach geriatric physical therapy and pharmacology, and I used to teach a um, basic skills class for the students. And so I'm going to incorporate a lot of that into this presentation today um, because we do a big focus on them protecting themselves when doing transfers and gait training and, and taking care of their patients. Um, and so I'm hoping to get some of that across for you guys as well. Um, then what I'm going to do is transition into a little discussion of fall prevention and fall recovery. Um, I tried to add a little bit onto this because last time I did this presentation, I got a lot of feedback that this was a, a big issue and a big concern for, for a lot of the people attending. So hopefully I'll address some of that. And um, again, you guys are welcome to ask questions. So, okay, so before we get started, um, I always do this with my students too, because when we are talking about transferring or um, you know, moving around our loved ones in bed or walking with them and trying to keep them safe, um, you have to think about your own safety as well. Um, and you have to think about your body mechanics. So I think we're really good about this when we're doing things like these individuals, when you're gonna move a sofa right? You slow down and you make sure that you squat down and you get a nice wide base of support with your feet and you communicate with the other person that you're working with and you say, hey, let's lift this on three. Are you ready? 
one, two, three, and you make sure you have a clear path and you, you know, this, this is ideally, although I don't know, sometimes I think at the end of moving day, all that falls apart, (laughs) but usually we're very conscious of how we're doing this. Um, And then when we start working with people, we forget a lot of these rules, right? There's a lot more going on and people are more unpredictable. So it's not the same but we need to, at a minimum, be using a lot of these same strategies to start to keep ourselves safe. Um, so think about what you already know about body mechanics, and then I'm going to revisit a lot of that as we go through this. Okay, I'm a little, I'm a dog lover, um, so I had to put this picture in. I think they're so sweet. Um, okay, so when we're moving individuals around in bed, I don't have videos of this, but I'm going to talk you guys through it, and then we'll have videos of some of the other activities. Um, but a couple of things I want you to think about when you're trying to, say, move a loved one up in bed or down in bed or over to the side is first have them help you if they can. Um, I think we tend to think as caregivers that it's our job to, to, to do a lot of this and to do all of this sometimes. And you're really doing a disservice, not only to yourself, but to the person that you're caring for um, by really having them help and having them do some of the work that keeps them stronger. It keeps them more engaged and it makes you less likely to get injured. Um, So this might be something as simple as having them try to lift up their bottom when they're moving up in bed. It might be pushing through their arms a little bit. It might be pushing through their feet a little bit, but really just trying to engage them can be really, really helpful. Um, What goes along with that is communicating with them, right? So telling them what you're about to do if you're gonna move them up in bed or down in bed, um, really giving them a heads up and coordinating, right? Like the couple that was lifting the sofa, you wanna you wanna again coordinate and say, okay, let's move you up in bed. Okay, on three, I want you to push through your arms and push through your feet and we're gonna move you. And then having that countdown and really kind of working as a team can really protect you and again, keep them strong. Um, Other things to think about, um, we talk a lot with the students about points of control. And points of control are basically the shoulders and the hips. So the idea behind this is if you need to move somebody in bed, we don't wanna grab their arms and we don't wanna grab their legs. You wanna be careful with their joints and really and really protect them. So where you wanna be moving them from is their shoulders or their hips. So really reaching around where you're getting hold of their their shoulder blades, Um, reaching their hips, maybe getting underneath the hips and lifting there. That's gonna make it a lot easier and a lot safer to move them. It's also gonna get them closer to you, which is gonna make it safer to move them, right? Just like that couple picking up the sofa, they're not gonna pick it up with their arms extended, right? They're gonna get in nice and close and really use those biceps. So thinking about thinking about those points of control and really getting in close to move that individual. Um, another thing to consider if you have somebody that it's it's tricky to help move them around in bed and they're needing some assistance. Um, a lot of times we'll use what we call a draw sheet. And what a draw sheet is is you can just fold up a regular sheet. And then you want to make it the length where it can fit under the shoulder blades to their hips. And then what you'll do is you can grab hold of that sheet and use that to help move them up in bed or down in bed or to the side. Um, So that that can be really helpful just to um, to make it a little bit less stress on you. All right. Okay, so that's kind of what we call bed mobility. Um, And now we're gonna get into what we talk about as transfers. So with this, we're talking about things maybe from transferring someone out of a wheelchair to standing, uh, maybe transferring them out of a wheelchair into a bed. Um, This could even be transferring to a toilet. Um, So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the principles And then I'm gonna show you some videos of these transfers. Um, So talking about principles, 
we're going to revisit some of these same concepts because I really want to emphasize this. Um, and that's, again, have the person help as much as possible. Um, so the more work they're doing, the stronger it keeps them, the more engaged it keeps them, and the less likely you are to get hurt um, because you're not having to do as much of the work. Um, so again, really make this a team effort um, and make it a coordinated team effort. So again, that communication is still gonna be really key with this. Um, if you're moving someone to the wheelchair, to the bed, really talking them through it, letting them know what the plan is and uh, making sure that you're moving you know, at the same time. Clearing the area. Um, again, that couple with the sofa, hopefully they made sure that there was a clear path. They made sure someone had the door open. You know, you you plan ahead to make sure that there's not these fall hazards as you're as you're moving that furniture. Same thing with people when we're transferring them from one surface to another. Look down. Is there something underneath their feet? Um, the footrest of the wheelchair is a big one. A lot of times they can get caught up in that. So do you need to either take that off or move that footrest completely out of the way before they go and get into the bed? Um, you know, just looking at other things on the floor and making sure that there's nothing that they're going to trip over it can be really important. Um, locking the wheelchair. <laughs> this is one um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have experience with this. It's such an easy thing to forget to do um, and can be really detrimental. Um, so you really just have to make yourself slow down before you're doing these things and really go through this checklist, uh, making sure the area is clear. There's nothing in the way, um, locking the wheelchair. Um, you can have um, the individual, and we like to train our patients to be independent and to lock the wheelchair. Um, but we always tell our students, you still need to double check because people do get confused with those wheelchair locks sometimes. And sometimes they think they're locking them and they're actually unlocking the wheelchair. So that's something to, to be aware of, just always making sure it's stable before you start these transfers. Um, and then you're gonna see in these photos, a gate belt being used. And this is something that therapists rely on a lot for safety. This gives you a handhold on someone. So you're not having to grab them by the arms or having to grab their pants. Like we, we always see that. Um, I've worked in independent assisted living facilities for years. And you'll see that a lot where, where people grab the pants to help someone balance and walk. And I, I bet a lot of you guys can relate to that. Um, and there's a place for that. That's not going to go away. But a lot of times this gate belt can be a little safer option. So you'll see that when we get into these videos. Um, so the first video is going to be a standing transfer from a wheelchair to a bed. OK, and with standing transfers, one of the things that I want you guys to be aware of and to think about is this concept of orthostatic hypotension. And what that is, is that's basically a fancy term for dizziness that comes on with a change of position. So you'll see this a lot with people who've been um, bedridden for a long time. Um, you'll see this after surgery. Um, it's, you'll see it with certain conditions. Um, it's common with Parkinson's disease. And then a lot of medications can cause this. Um, a lot of heart medications, um, one's for blood pressure, one's for heart failure. And what will happen is people will go to sit up and their blood pressure will drop 20, 30 points. And then what will happen is they'll get dizzy and, and can, can have falls from this. So typically, if the blood pressure is dropping with the top number, that systolic number, into um, usually the 80s is when I see it being really problematic. But if you see that number that's normally, say, 120 over 80 is normally, we'll say normal blood pressure. If that top number 120 starts to get closer to 80 or 90, then a lot of times you'll get that dizziness. Um, so you can check this in your in your loved ones by checking their blood pressure lying down and then checking it sitting or standing and see if you see that difference. Um, 
And sometimes this needs to be addressed with a doctor. Um, sometimes this will just be temporary with an adjustment to a new medication or recovery from an illness. Um, but if this keeps being problematic and is, and is resulting in falls, then sometimes you need to look at, um, the doctor might really wanna look at their medication list and see if there's something that can be changed. Um, so, so definitely something to be aware of with these transfers. Um, the next video will be a sliding board transfer. And this is gonna be nice if the person you're caring for maybe doesn't have as good a leg strength, or if you're worried about their legs buckling, um, if you just don't feel safe for bringing them to a full standing position, but need to get them from the wheelchair to the bed, this is a good option. And then the last one is a dependent transfer. And that's really with someone who doesn't have a lot of strength in their arms or their legs. So with this, um, we'll show you the video, but I really recommend if the person you're caring for needs that much help being transferred, um, it's really best to bring in a therapist and to have them help kind of train you on how to do that safely. Okay, let's see if these videos work. And again, you won't be able to hear it. I'm gonna kind of stop and talk about it. like Walgreens, CS, you can order them. Of course, everything you can get from Amazon. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Walters, we missed about uh, 90 seconds of what you were saying when you uh, stopped the video. I just got a message that my connection's not good. Let me try here. I'm gonna see if I can get a better connection. Let's Okay, so let's try this again. Thanks, Rob, for letting me know. Um, so what I wanted to point out here was the gate belt. So this is what I was talking about. This is just a great way to have kind of a handhold um, and just to have a little safer way than grabbing hold of someone's pants to transfer them. So you can get these at Walgreens or CVS. Um, you can order these online. Um, but these are these can be a, a handy tool if you're having to do a lot of a lot of transfers with the person that you're caring for. Um, the other thing I want to point out is if you'll notice how close the chair is to the bed. Um, she's really trying to minimize this extra distance um, where maybe there's not a safe place to land. So when she's this close with the transfer, if she stands up and gets dizzy, she can put her right back in the chair or if they're in the middle of the transfer, it's still easy to get her onto another surface quickly. And she's taken off the armrest. You don't need to do that necessarily with standing transfers. Sometimes it's better for the individual to use those armrests to stand up. Okay, right here, I want you to notice her body mechanics. Do you see how she's squatting down with that nice neutral back? I want you to pay attention to how she keeps that form. Um, you'll also notice she's explaining to, the, to her patient exactly what she's about to do. And then you'll see she's staying right in front of her. And then the idea is that if her legs do start to buckle, she can kind of block at her knees. Um, so she can have her knees kind of touching the other person's knees. And then she can use that to, to block if they start to buckle a little bit. So that's a standing transfer. Um, next, we're gonna go to a sliding board transfer. Oh, here we go.
So again, slide boards you can get at stores. Um, you can order online. Um, they're, they're a nice tool to have if, again, you don't feel safe really getting someone all the way up to a standing position. The wheelchair is nice and close. She took off the armrest. And then she's placing it underneath the bottom, under the hips of the patient. Okay, and this is important. You'll see it's sticking up and she's addressing that. That's normal for that to stick up like that. As her weight comes onto it, it'll lower down. What I will warn you about though, is if you're using this with someone, you wanna make sure they don't wrap their hands around the sliding board. Because what can happen is then when it does come down, they can crush their fingers. Um, so we always wanna check and make sure that the person using the sliding board has their hand flat on top of it and not wrapped around. Um, but we do want them helping if possible. And you'll see that with this patient, she's gonna be pushing with the, with the armrest of the wheelchair and then she'll have her other hand on the sliding board so she can help us out. So her hands flat on the sliding board. And she's gonna make it a couple small movements. So she's squatting, she's got a nice neutral back. She has the patient scooting forward in the wheelchair and then she's blocking her knees so she doesn't slide off of that board. And then she's making it a couple nice little slides along the board to get her onto the table, staying in front of her the whole time so she doesn't come off of that board. So again, that kind of blocking at the knees. So that's what we call a sliding board transfer. And again, good if they can help a little bit with their arms. Um, they can use their legs a little bit to help, but they don't, they can do this without a lot of leg strength. Okay. All right, now this is what we call a dependent transfer. So this is really um, when they don't have a lot of arm strength or a lot of leg strength and you're doing all the work. And this is very physically demanding. Um, we spend a lot of time on this with our students and we really work with them and watch their body mechanics and correct them. Um, so, you know, again, I, I wanna show it to you guys and I want you to be aware of, aware of this, but if you're finding that the person you're caring for really needs a lot of help with these movements, especially if you're having some you know, orthopedic problems or, pro or history of back pain, um, let a physical therapist come in and work with you and they can help kind of problem solve and how to make this most efficient and help you with your form to keep you safe. Um, but I'll, I'll show you guys an example of this dependent transfer. So here the patient is not able to help. So again, armrest is removed. The chair is really close to the surface. She has it angled. Footrests are out of the way. She has the gait belt on there. She's got that nice posture, neutral back, squatting down. And then this one, if she can't help with the arms, she actually just kind of puts them out of the way, right? So she has them on the patient's lap so they aren't getting caught up. And then she's blocking again at the knees. This one, she's actually kind of squeezing the knees together and then really using her body movement to transfer the patient. So again, she's not having to just physically lift all this weight. She's really trying to get this biomechanical advantage where you shift back a little bit and then really just use that, that movement to shift them safely onto the bed. Um, so there's quite an art to this. So again, you know, get help if you're really needing to, to do these, these, full, um, these full lifts like that with somebody. Okay. I'm gonna show this one one more time.
Again, the armrest is gone. Watch your body mechanics. Squeezing in the knees there. Patient forward. She's grabbing hold of that gait belt. Good, nicely done. She would pass her practical. <laughs> okay. All right, good. All right, so let's go on to the next one. Um, all right, so those are those are just some um, tips for for transferring. Um, now, what we want to talk about is when you're walking with a patient. We call it gait training, but a lot of times it can just be out walking with an individual. Um, I'm going to try to move this out of the way a little bit here. Um, so a couple of things to think about is, again, those gait belts um, can be really handy. Um, they're even named after this activity, um, but they, they give you something to hold on to. So if you're out walking with someone, you're afraid they're going to lose their balance or fall. Um, that's a good way to just kind of kind of keep a hold of them. Just. OK, so. Um, so that's one thing to take into account. Um, other things you want to check for wear on the assisted devices. Okay, so in the picture here, they have this walker. And with this walker, you'll notice he's got about a 20 degree bend in the elbows. Um, and that's really what you want to look for. So the way you'll check walkers and canes is you'll have the individual hang their arm down by the side. And then what you want is you want the top of the device hitting just here on the outside, what we call the ulnar styloid, this little bump on your wrist. Um, you can also just line it up with the crease of the wrist if, if you don't have a real dominant bump. It's not, it doesn't have to be that specific, but lining it up kind of with the crease of the wrist. And that should result in about that 20 degree bend in the elbow. And this just gives them a little bit of push off on these devices. So if you get a new cane, if you get a new walker, um, that's how you can check the fit of it. Okay, other things to think about is the wear of the device. So a lot of these canes, a lot of these walkers have these little rubber pads on the bottom. And especially if you're using it outside, like the guy in the picture here, what you'll find is that they tend to really wear out. Um, and when they wear out, you end up with this metal scraping on the ground. Um, and then the other thing that can happen is they can end up creating these flaps. So what'll happen is the rubber will tear, you'll get a flap, and then that can kind of create a fall hazard as it gets caught when they're moving the device. So you really want to just regularly check the shape of those little um, rubber pads that are on canes and walkers. Um, you can get replacements at Walgreens or CVS. They're, they're standard size. Tricky to get on and off. I, I won't lie. They're a little bit, um, you, you might need a little help with that, but, but nice to just replace those from time to time. You'll also see people sometimes use tennis balls to help create a little bit of a smoother glide with these devices, or they'll have what they call little skis that you can get at drug stores. And you can put those um, in place of those little rubber pads. And those will also create a little bit um, smoother movement if you're moving these on carpet. Um, but again, even with the tennis balls, they do wear out. So, so just monitor that from time to time. Um, when walking with these individuals, you really want to try and stay slightly to the side and behind them. If you're really there trying to kind of prevent falls, um, she's actually in a perfect spot there. <laughs> um, the idea is that then you're ready with a hand maybe on the front of their shoulder if they start to fall forward. And then you can use that gait belt or have a hand kind of on the back if, um, if you need to support them that way. Um, so that's usually your safest position. And then with this, you know, gait training or, or walking around, what you want to think about is you want to think about, you know, kind of what could go wrong. Um, in general, turns are, are pretty tricky. So you really want to be extra careful when people are turning, especially with their walker or their assisted device. Um, that's where you'll see people a lot of times kind of get tripped up or lose their balance. 
um, with transitions from say carpet to a harder surface. That's another one you wanna be careful about. Um, a lot of times you'll see that kind of shuffling gait that'll occur. And that's where, you know, even those little slight transitions between rooms can trip people up. Um, so watching for that and just really trying to cue them to lift up their feet and to really work on um, not having that shuffling gait. Um, they're usually doing that because they're trying to keep their balance. Um, but that's where, again, you know, maybe they need some exercises to help improve their balance and to um, to work with their, their gait training so they're not having to do so much of that shuffling gait. Um, but you could also just kind of, again, cue them when going over those transitions. Okay. All right, so stairs. Um, and this is really interesting. I, uh, my mom lives here in town and she had knee surgery last year and it was supposed to be a little knee arthroscopy. It was supposed to be a little day surgery. I took the afternoon off work. I went to go pick her up and then <laughs> the doctor told me they actually ended up repairing the cartilage in her knee and they made her non-weight bearing for six weeks and then sent us out the door. So I'm guessing some of you guys have probably had similar experiences. We had no assisted devices. We were not set up for this. I had brought, I think, I think I'd brought a pair of crutches um, for the original knee surgery, but um, this was a, this was a game changer. And I couldn't believe it when they just said, she can't put weight on it for six weeks and, and sent us home. Um, so she has four steps to get into her house and no handrail. And I've been trying to get her at, to get a handrail for months and months and she doesn't want to paint it. So, so I've not succeeded in this, but um, we had to do a little bit of um, interesting stair training with my mom on this. So um, it's, you get into some tricky situations. I, I couldn't believe they just sent us home like that with no warning. Um, but, you know, you may have a couple stairs to get into your house. You may have some from the garage into the house, or you may have some stairs to, you know, get to the upstairs bedrooms. So this video is going to show you guys um, going up and downstairs and how to kind of safely guard someone who's doing that. So again, I'll kind of talk you through it. So she's just saying the assistive device is on the outside. She has her with a quad cane there, and then she's holding onto the rail. She has a gate belt on her. And she's gonna talk about going down the stairs first. A little photo bombing in the background. <laughs> And the term that we'll teach people, and you guys may have heard this, we'll say up with the good or down with the bad. So in general, what she's teaching is you'll go down with your weaker leg and up with your stronger leg. So now she's teaching her to step up with her stronger leg. And this is more of a, let me pause this for a second. Um, this is this is really um, more of an issue with say someone who's had like a maybe a knee replacement. Um, typically, if it's just a matter of maybe some arthritis or a little bit weak, um, you don't have to force that and, and make them go up with one leg. Um, but if someone's just had knee surgery until they've really gotten used to and trust that leg and can put some good weight on it. Um, you really want to go upstairs, stepping up onto that that better, stronger leg and going down with that weaker leg. And then you'll notice she's standing behind her as she goes up the steps. Um, she could be even more behind her. She's trying to, to let you see here. Um, but you want to be behind them and below them when they're going up the steps. So if they fall backwards, you're ready to stop them from falling. Um, so some things you can do to keep yourself safer 
is to have your feet staggered on the steps and then to not be moving necessarily when they're moving. So what she'll do is she'll let her go up a step and then she'll move and then she'll let her go up a step and then she'll move. So she's stable when when the patient's moving and then can have this nice, you know, wide base of support and staggered stance to help if she needs to. And then I'm gonna come back to the first one that she did here. And then again, noting as the patient is coming down the stairs on this one, she's below her. So again, the idea is if she starts to fall forward, she can protect her. Um, and she can have a hand on the shoulder, again, looking for kind of that staggered stance that she's showing right now. Um, so again, you know, just really being ready for, for things to go wrong and kind of being prepared so that you can safely step in to help without injuring yourself. She's holding on to the gate belt. She could also have a hand on the shoulder. Um, you could have your hand on the rail if you need to. Um, and again, she's trying to let you see her patient, but you could even be right behind them a little bit more. So up with that stronger leg, the patient moves and then she moves. And she's just going over the, the assistive device. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. And again, you know, stairs can be tricky. So um, again, this is where a physical therapist can, can kind of help you problem solve um, and really individualize it to the person that, um, that, you're, that you're working with in the situation. Do you have two handrails? Do you have one handrail? Are you like my mom and won't listen to her daughter and have no handrails? Um, can you talk your mom into getting handrails, you know? So um, a, a lot of that, you, you can look at the individual situation, but again, just thinking about kind of where you're standing and thinking about, are you in a position where you can protect them if they start to fall? Um, so really, again, that kind of pausing and thinking about what you're doing. Um, we tend to just start kind of walking behind them. And then if they start to fall, it's really easy for us to, to go down with them. So think about that staggered stance. Um, again, you know, have that gait belt if you feel like that's helpful as well. Okay. All right. So a lot of this we're talking about is how to protect yourself um, and how to really kind of plan and communicate to prevent things going wrong. Um, and, and a lot of what we're doing is also trying this to prevent falls as much as possible. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that specifically, and then we'll talk about what happens if you do have a fall. Okay, so for, um, risk factors for falls, there's there's a, a ton of them. Um, and it really just is, it's just such a, a common occurrence um, as we get older. Um, so, you know, what we have to do is just what we can to really minimize this happening. And, and a lot of that is really watching for these changes in function and being extra careful when someone is, is kind of dealing with these changes in function. So um, sometimes that's cognitive changes and that might be from new medications that are just making you a little bit less aware um, from disease processes that are affecting your um, affecting your mind. Um, sometimes post-surgically, you'll see this um, delirium that presents where you're just not as cognitively aware um, for a while. Or you can have those effects from like anesthesia, 
where it just stays in your system and makes you kind of groggy. Um, so just being extra careful during those times. Um, even things as simple as like a urinary tract infection, these just mild infections can cause a big change in function. Um, so, you know, when, when you're starting to see these declines in function, just really being extra careful until, until that condition has been taken care of, until it's been treated. Um, it's just amazing to me what a simple urinary tract infection can do temporarily to someone's function. Um, changes of medication. Um, this is a big one. Um, so when you first get medication changes is when you're most likely going to have those side effects. Um, this is especially problematic um, in regards to falls with things like sleep medications. Um, a lot of times they stay in your system. You go up to, you know, you know, you go to get up in the middle of the night and you're still groggy from that medication. Or maybe you get up in the morning and you're still having those kind of hangover effects from it. Um, so, you know, if this is really a common occurrence, then you might need to look at Sometimes they can change the dosage of the medication. They can change to one that has a shorter half-life um, where it gets out of your system faster. So if you do get up in the middle of the night, um, you won't have as much medication in your system. Um, so don't be afraid to have those conversations with your doctor or pharmacists are, are great too for this to say, you know, what options do I have? Um, Again, cardiac medications can really cause a lot of this dizziness. Um, so whenever you're getting these increases with like a blood pressure medication, there's the risk of having more of that dizziness, um, increased risk of falls that you'll see with that. Um, again, heart failure, a lot of those cardiac medications can cause this dizziness. So really just being, being aware of that. Um, opioids as well. Um, so just being extra cautious when we have these changes in medication and communicating with the doctor if this medication change is really creating the fall risk. Um, and your therapist can help you with that as well. Um, vision changes are a big risk. So just really important to just regularly check your vision and to be extra cautious when adjusting to things like even bifocals. Um, see a lot of falls when people first start getting used to bifocals or trifocals or all these changes in your in your vision like that. Um, and then footwear. And this is a this is a easy one in theory to fix. Um, but a lot of these house shoes that we have that just are sliding around and um, or, or tripping us up, you know, just making sure that we really have good footwear in the house. Um, so these are some things we can watch out for, be aware of, and um, we can't fix this, but we can kind of manage it and just be extra cautious. Okay, the other thing is the home environment. Um, so it's really important to, to, again, focus on prevention with this. Um, we're not going to prevent this from happening 100%, but we really want to try and minimize it. So there's a lot of um, a lot of associations and a lot of clinics as well will have these home safety checklists on their website. Um, so the American Physical Therapy Association has one. If you look up home safety checklist, um, there's a link here. Um, but you can Google home safety checklist for American Physical Therapy Association. And what will come up is this room by room list of fall hazards. And so what you can do is you can go to the bedroom and just go through this list. And it'll be things like, are there cords on the floor? Are there loose magazines? Um, is the pathway from the bed to the bathroom clear and well lit? Um, some of it will be pretty obvious and some of it you may not have thought about until you, you've had an experience with it. Um, one of the big ones with the bathroom is the towel bar. Um, I'm sure you guys have probably had some experience with this where you grab hold of the towel, towel, towel bar for balance and you pull it out of the wall. Um, so really not relying on that for a balance tool. If you're needing a bar, then you want to get a grab bar installed that's designed for you to hold on to and to help you balance when, you know, getting up from the toilet or getting out of the shower. You don't want to have that towel roll be what towel bar be what you're relying on. 
Um, it'll go through the kitchen and look at things like, are there certain things that you use all the time, but they're on these higher shelves? And are you having to bring your head back and reach up for them? A lot of people get dizzy with that neck extension. So really bringing those down, the stuff that you're using frequently um, and putting them where they're within reach. Um, so a lot of little changes like that, um, but they will take you room by room. Um, centers for disease control. I feel like we're all very familiar with them lately. Um, they also have a home safety checklist that'll take you room by room. And some of these will also cover things like um, smoke detectors. And, you know, do you have these new ones that are, you know, 10 year batteries or have they been changed? Is anybody monitoring this? Um, do you have maybe a device that detects gas if the gas has been left on the stove? Um, so, so some of them, you know, are looking more at kind of things on the floor and um, some of them are looking at kind of wider safety concerns. Um, but this is where you can go through and do this with one of these checklists or a home health therapist is a, is a great tool. They can come in and go through your home with you and really look at maybe how you could make it safer. Um, and decrease risk of falls. Okay, so the reality is that we're trying to avoid falls as much as possible. Um, the reality is we're still gonna have it, this happen from time to time. So we need to be prepared for that. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about fall recovery. And this is Matt and he um, is gonna walk us through it a little bit. So I'm gonna, um, again, you guys won't be able to hear this, but what I'm going to do is he's going to demonstrate how to get up off of the floor. Um, so I'm going to let him get started. And well, okay, so first here, what he's doing is just introducing um, the concept of this fall recovery and really, you know, thinking about having a system in place for notifying someone if you do have a fall. So in other words, a lot of people are using their Alexa. Um, I shouldn't say that I have one in the other room and she's gonna end up calling. <laughs> um, for real. Um, so the Alexa, people are using Apple watches now, they have fall detectors in them. Um, there's a lot of these life alert systems so you really wanna have this in place before you need it. Um, so some means of, of, of getting help and you have to think about the room that you're in, right? So if your device is in your, again, I don't wanna say it, she's gonna hear me. If it's, it's in your kitchen and you're in your bedroom, do you have a way to get help in that room? So really kind of going room by room and, and thinking of means of, of, of getting help. Um, so again, I like the life alert, but if your loved one is relying on that and you aren't there, you really need to make sure they have that on them. I can't tell you how many patients I've treated who had falls and they had that sitting on their dresser next to their bed, or they had it sitting on the nightstand, um, you know, or in a, a coffee table in another room. So they're helpful if you have them on you when you fall or you can get to them. Um, they're not as helpful sitting in, in a drawer in your dresser. So, um, so, you know, really think about kind of what's gonna work for you, but have some sort of system in place. Okay, and then he's gonna kind of demonstrate how you would get up off of the floor. And so I'm gonna take this forward here. Okay, um, all right, so he's gonna, so here Matt, Matt has fallen on the floor and he's gonna kind of walk you through, you can watch how he gets up. Um, the way he's demonstrating is really good for people that um, have knee pain, especially. So I'm gonna let him demonstrate.
And what he's doing here is he's saying, let's do a body scan. So first thing, if someone's fallen, try to get onto your back, relax. There can be that kind of element of being in shock. Um, so pause, take a minute, and then do this body scan. You know, did I, did I fall and maybe hurt my wrist? Did I fall on my shoulder? Did I fall on my hip? Is anything hurting? Could I have fractured something, right? Like that's one of our big concerns. Is there a fracture? And then our other big concern is, did I hit my head? Um, and if the person that you're caring for is on any kind of blood thinner, so a lot of people will be put on blood thinners if they've had ischemic strokes or if they've had heart attacks. Those blood thinners can cause these brain bleeds. So if someone's had a fall and they hit their head, um, really best to just have them go in and get a CAT scan and make sure that they don't have a slow, a slow brain bleed. Um, sometimes this can take a couple days and then it can really be um, it can, can really be missed. Um, so if they hit their head, really a good idea just in their own blood thinners, just go and get a CAT scan and make sure everything's all right. So first doing that body scan. And he's just checking his elbows. He's checking his shoulders, just kind of checking knees ankles, making sure everything's moving, not broken. Calming yourself down, taking deep breaths, and then figuring out how to get up off of the floor. So looking at if one of the hips is sore, rolling onto the other one, getting onto your side. Coming up into a sitting position. And then you have the legs out in front of you. And what you'll see is he's going to use different devices to kind of build a set of steps onto the sofa. Um, so if you don't have real good leg strength, this is a way you can adapt. He's got a little one at home, so he's got pans. <laughs> in his living room in a cute little toilet there. <laughs> Some kids books. But the idea is just getting any kind of objects that might be close at hand and then creating this little set of stairs that you can kind of scoot yourself onto. Um, so again, good option if you don't have great knee strength. Um, you can also, he's going to show this in a minute, pull the sofa cushions off and use that to kind of create some steps onto, um, you know, onto back onto that sofa if you don't have enough leg strength to get up. And so this is one option, just creating these steps. Um, but if you don't have objects around you, he's going to show you another option now. So he's pulling out the sofa cushion. And he's going to push it to the side. Um, but again, you can use that as a little bit of a little riser to get you up a little bit higher and a little closer to being on the sofa. Um, he's doing that to create kind of a firmer surface um, and then not quite a high surface that you're having to kind of climb up onto. But the cushions can be used if you don't have something else to, to lift yourself onto. And again, even, even this way, this is designed to, to help if you don't have as good a leg strength, but this still requires some leg strength and some arm strength. So again, this is where a physical therapist can come in and we can look and see, um, you know, if they can't get up off the floor, they might be able to design an exercise program to build up strength so that they can get to where they can do this on their own. Um, the traditional way will teach people to get up off of the floor too, if they don't have any knee problems, is to get onto their hands and knees 
um, and then to crawl towards a surface like a sofa or a chair, something stable, and then to bring one leg forward into half kneeling and to climb up that way. Um, so that's another way that you can get up. It requires a good bit of leg strength. So again, you know, this is where we we problem solve and we look at at the particular situation and you know what are the the what are where the challenges this person is dealing with? Have they had you know shoulder surgery or knee surgery or arthritis? And how can we kind of modify this and, and teach them how to do this with those restrictions? So. Um, don't be afraid to to pull in a physical therapist because this is really easy for me to show you a video of how to do this, but um, real life gets it gets a lot more complex. Okay, so to to kind of recap, think about having a fall detection system in place, um, and you know figure out what works for you individually, and and use your you share friends with this. You'll you'll learn an amazing amount of information from one another. Um, we um, there's these matter of balance programs. I'm not sure if if age does this. They're, they're I'm sure they're familiar with it, but um, I'm sure Rob will talk about that later. But the matter of balance programs they have these groups of older adults, and it's amazing what they learn from one another because um, they'll say, "Well, I like this, and this works well for me," and um, so they can, you know, your, your friends can be great source of advice on that and what works for them. Um, again, you know, pause, check for injury, check and see if you had hit your head. If you're on blood thinners and hit your head, a CAT scan can really rule out any of those kind of slow brain bleeds. As we get older, a lot of times we get the shrinkage. And so our brain is more likely to, to shift around and, and we can get some damage with that with these injuries. Um, again, work with a physical therapist if you can't get up off the floor or if you have particular knee or shoulder problems that, that need to be worked around. Um, and then the other thing they can do is they can work with you as the caregiver to show you how to help someone get up off the floor. Um, so you can always call and get the, get the nice fireman to come. Um, I think my mom's going to start doing that just because she wants some good looking firemen come to her house. <laughs> she jokes about that a lot with getting her smoke detectors changed. They came out and put in 10 year smoke detectors for her. But, um, again, a therapist can, can come in and just do a few visits on teaching you how to, to help lift, you know, and, and work with getting, um, getting your loved one off the floor if, um, if they need help and can't do that on their own. So a lot of times that's easier to work with on an individual basis. Um, and don't feel like this has to be a, a you know, extensive, um, extensive, you know, therapy process. What we're finding now, um, unfortunately, with the Medicare billing changes that came around in um, January, is there's a big push for therapists to focus on caregiver training, and they're only getting typically maybe three or four visits with a lot of their patients in home health. Um, but those three or four visits can be enough to work on things like this checking for fall hazards and teaching um, teaching you how to safely transfer somebody or teaching you how to, to get them up off the floor. Um, so just, just remember that resource is available. You just have to tell your doctor that you want to get some home health services um, for, for caregiver training. Okay, and then lastly, um, I, I just thought this was a great quote. It says, there's four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Um, and there's there's a lot of a lot of truth to this statement. So um, I just want to say thank you to you guys. You're serving a really really important role, and it's it's a really it can be a really challenging um, job. So please reach out. And um, there's a lot of medical providers. There's lots of agencies like Age. Um, that are that are here to help you with this and through this. So so please reach out and see how we can help you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Walters. We appreciate that wonderful presentation. I'll ask you to go ahead and unshare your screen, and we'll just have a little quick conversation with some of the questions people have asked. Uh, you had mentioned a matter of balance, and yes, Age of Central Texas does offer that. Uh, we have a program called Caregiver You 
and it offers caregiver classes uh, all throughout the year. In addition to falls prevention classes, one of them we offer is called A Matter of Balance. It is a nationally renowned evidence-based program. Uh, of course, when COVID started, we were not able to offer our in-person classes anymore, so we pivoted to some virtual classes, and we're offering those throughout the year currently as well, and we created a falls prevention class that was based around a lot of the curriculum from A Matter of Balance. So we're offering those for free, so they're virtual, and there's information in your program and your caregiver resources that we sent to you and that we will again send to you at the end of these sessions. If you're joining us afterwards and watching the recording, down below in the details information is also a link that you can click that will give you all of the resources as well. But yes, we do have those false prevention classes that we offer all throughout the year. So Dr. Walters, thank you for pointing those out. Also wanted to note that Age of Central Texas also has a health equipment lending program. So anytime you need any durable medical equipment, we loan it for free, no questions asked. So anybody who's in the Central Texas area, you can call our offices and we will provide that for you for free. You had talked about gate belts. So that's one of the items that we have a lot of and we give those away for free. Just call and request one and we will get you one. And in fact, we have a question about the gate belt. How tight does it need to be on the body? Is it, do you wear it about the same tightness that you would just a regular belt or do you need it a little bit looser so you can get your hand in there? What's the proper way for an older adult to wear the gait belt where it's most effective? You actually want it to be tighter than a typical belt, um, especially because when you put it on, um, typically they're sitting down when you put it on and then when they go to stand up, it's going to loosen up significantly. So you want it to be tight to where it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's it's kind of like your pants at Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know, where it's just a little a little too tight. You want the belt to feel like that. And then when they stand up, it should loosen um, and be more comfortable. Um, but you want to be able to kind of just squeeze your hand in there, but not have a lot of room. Um, for it to loosen. And it's a good idea to make sure you put it on correctly. Um, you have to put it through the teeth first. So if you can kind of check it before they really go to move and kind of pull on it to make sure it doesn't loosen up. Um, but now go a little tighter than you think is comfortable. And then when they stand up, if it's still too loose, you might need to tighten it a little bit more. Yeah, you talk about teeth. It, it has a buckle on it that's like one of those mm -hmm. military belts that yeah. has the little jagged teeth that that holds on to the webbing of the belt itself. And yeah. so that's how they attach and they buckle on. Yeah, we have lots of those. If you have a need for one, give us a call at Age of Central Texas and we'll make sure that we get you one. Um, when you were talking about uh, how to measure for a walker or uh, a uh, cane, you were talking about the bump on the hand. Can you hmm. show that? Because you were talking about it, let's show it visually so everybody understands what you were discussing. Yeah, so this bone here, it's on, it should be near your, your little finger. Um, there's a bump here, a bone on the outside of your wrist that's called your ulnar styloid. So this is where you want the assistive device to come to when your arm is hanging at your side. So the arm should be relaxed at the side. Um, and again, it's, 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 just, it's just near the wrist crease. So kind of lining it up with that wrist crease. And then it should, you'll see about a 20 degree bend um, when, when they're in that position. So it gives a little bit of push through that device so their arms aren't fully extended. And that's true for canes and for walkers. Excellent. Thank you so much on that. Yeah. Um, speaking of durable medical equipment, when you have an older loved one that you know needs to be using something for their own safety and they're just refusing, you know, you talk about your mom <laughs> who doesn't like to use the handrail. Um, is there a is there a nice way to discuss that with them? What what is your as a professional, your suggestion? on how to have that conversation with your older loved one so that you're not ending up putting up a wall between them that they don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to look at your individual situation. Like, um, 
you know, you, you have to look at my mom will listen to me. My dad will not listen to me. So for my dad, I would be better off. Well, she won't listen to me about the handrail, but that's because it's it's her. It's aesthetic. She would listen to me about a walker, but um, my dad won't listen to me at all. So for that, I feel like pulling in a medical professional to have that conversation can be really helpful. Um, an outside person can sometimes be more helpful. Um, so it depends a little bit on your relationship with your, your loved one. Um, now my mom, she, she, she's a little more receptive, so I can, I can kind of have those conversations and then can kind of back up the medical professional. So that can be nice if you're not ganging up on the loved one, but a team where you're saying, look, we really want what's best for you. Will you try this out? Um, and a lot of times just having someone try it, um, can be really helpful. So, so, you know, just let's say, let's give this a try. Why don't you use it for a couple of days? And, and if it's not working, then we'll come up with something else or trying a less restrictive device. So maybe they really are resistant to a walker, but maybe you can get a, you know, a colorful cane and just try that. So um, you really have to look case by case, but those, those are sometimes, sometimes considerations. Um, yeah. yeah. One of the things that we talked about yesterday and in our first session was how a lot of times since we are the children of the parents, now a lot of times we're in role reversal. We're kind of mm -hmm. having to parent the parent, but our parents don't, they still see us as the young child. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> a lot of times when we say things to them, you know, it's in one ear out the other, even though we are trying to have their best interest at heart. So sometimes yeah. having that third party person is mm -hmm. very helpful. And we talked yesterday about using your doctor as let them be the bad guy. Exactly. You know, have that conversation with, with the doctor beforehand or another great suggestion yesterday from our presenter was when you go in for the doctor's appointment, have a note already written. So when you check in, have that note that says, I need you, we're having this issue mm -hmm. and I need you to have this conversation while we're in the room. Because Absolutely. You don't, want to, you don't want to do that in front of the person. You know, that's, that's not fair to them. You don't want to hurt the feelings. But if you let the doctor know, this is something we need to talk about, let the doctor be the bad guy. He's already, mm -hmm. he or she is already set up now, knows that this is something we need to discuss while we're together in the room. And let them do it, you know, write a prescription for you have to have a, a walker or something to that knowledge. So if it's coming from the medical professional, then it has some weight. Exactly. And as the caregiver, as the family member, you can say, don't you remember that the doctor said you need to do this? Mm -hmm. So then you've got, you know, they were the bad guy who said you have to do this. But, you know, that's what the doctor says you need to do. We need to do it. So. And you have to think of who's the, the authority figure, you know, sometimes it's a doctor, sometimes it's a, sometimes it is a child, sometimes, you know, their, their voice will be heard. And, and sometimes you need to, to go outside of the family to get, to get that taken care of. So absolutely. Right. And, you know, again, somebody that the older adult trusts and will listen to, mm -hmm. maybe it's a friend, maybe it's the pastor, somebody, you know, use that third party if, if you need to, um, I know in my case of being a caregiver, you know, I can say something 200 times and then one other family member will say it once and they'll go, oh yeah, I need to do that. And you're going, I've said that so many times when you listen to me, but yeah. you know, sometimes it just needs, they need to hear it from somebody else. Absolutely. I've got a couple questions about, uh, about walking in, in terms of fall prevention. One is uh, have a loved one who shuffles their feet. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a way to address that, um, again, gently and nicely, that, that the shuffling that can cause a fall? So, I, you know, I think that one of the big things to remember is that they're doing that shuffling as a compensatory mechanism for not necessarily having balance. So if you think about when you normally walk, there's that period of time where you're on one foot and you're transitioning to another one. So you've gotta be able to balance to make that transition and they're not able to do that. So to compensate, they're trying to keep both feet on the ground so they don't have to go to that. Um, so a lot of times doing balance training to increase single leg stance, do like even practicing standing on one foot. 
So having at a countertop and practicing standing on one foot and kind of building up your ability to do that and your balance can be helpful. Um, sometimes it can be a strength issue where maybe they can't lift their leg up enough. Um, so building up some hip strength, those that standing marching exercises that you see a lot with older adults, you know, trying to really work on building up the endurance of those muscles so you can create clearance. So I think you can cue it, but you also have to address the reason why they're doing it um, because they're not doing it. Uh, they're not consciously doing it. They're doing it as a kind of a, a safety mechanism and a compensatory uh, mechanism. So a lot of times building up strength can help that and balance. And, you know, a lot of times also we see with older adults who have a cognitive issue. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the things that happens as we grow older is that our peripheral vision starts coming in. And sure. so if you are seeing like this, then you can't see where your feet are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as you said, it's, it's your self safety of the shuffling. Also, a lot of times for older adults uh, and particularly those who have dementia is that they can't tell distance. Mm -hmm. um, particularly. So if you've got, let's say, a pattern in the rug where it goes from light to dark, that dark spot now looks like a hole in the floor. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's a I'm great point. Shuffle over those things because I'm, I might, in my mind, I'm stepping in a hole. Mm hmm. So that's a great point, Rob. And, and, and that's true with a lot of, um, you know, that that's again, where some of those home safety checklists can be helpful, you know, with considerations like that, like some of the carpet that you have or the steps, you know, can they, do they have that depth perception? You know, is this in response to not being able to tell where the step goes down? Do you need to put some tape on it? Maybe, um, you know, some colored tape or reflective tape to see that. So yeah, a lot of times you can, can kind of modify their environment too. Now, is there is there honestly any real danger um, or safety issue with someone shuffling other uh, as opposed to taking regular steps? I mean, you know, I think there's more risk of the the foot getting caught up and creating kind of a trip hazard. So that that's why we try to avoid that typically. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. Uh, another person uh, notes that their husband has Parkinson's disease and so wants to know if there's a particular type of shoe that is best for someone who is a fall risk to use? So I would say, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of um, support groups with, with these new diagnoses with like, with, with this, I feel like they have better information than I do because they're, um, they're, they're living with this, right? And so they've kind of gone through a lot of these different options. So in general, you know, just making sure that it's a stable shoe um, that's not, um, you know, not like these little house shoes or not something with a real, you know, you don't see this as much with men, but you don't want to see too high of a, of a, um, a you know, of a footbed where they're going to end up turning their ankle. Um, so, but I would recommend, um, Judith, there's some great organizations in town. Um, the Capital Area Parkinson's Society is fantastic. Um, and um, there's, power for Parkinson's. There's a lot of really great support groups where um, you could connect with other people and they can they can really advise you on that. Um, Capital Area Parkinson Society does monthly lectures and they'll sometimes bring in specialists to talk about different topics like that. Um, so I would I would look that up and and try to, to you know to really use those professional organizations for some information. I can't recommend a specific type of shoe, but I bet they could. Yeah, yeah. The Capital Area Parkinson Society is fantastic. We partner with them quite often. Georgetown has also a very active group, the Georgetown Area Parkinson Society. <laughs> Uh, there's also a great one in Cedar Park. So if you're in any of those areas, they're great ones. Uh, you can always contact us here at Age of Central Texas and we can help you connect the dots to those organizations. So that is that is a great point. Um, we talked about you know having the gate belt um, to help if someone starts to fall, uh, if we're going up or down the stairs, how to position your foot to catch them. Mm -hmm. If we're walking along and all of a sudden our loved one starts to fall, is there a smart, safe way to catch them 
to keep them from falling, let's say they don't have a gate belt. Let's say, you know, we're just walking and all of a sudden you see them start to go. Yeah. What, what should we do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a couple things to think about. One is, um, can you have a specific way that you're going to fall? And um, this is kind of a controversial. I, I, a lot of people have different opinions on this. Um, but I think in general, you want to think about kind of where where is it going to be most harmful to land? So, so that's one thing to think about. You know, in general, if you can land on a more padded area, I think we all know what that tends to be for, for ourselves. But to not fall on the hip, but to land on a more padded area. Um, can help. And then I think, you know, your your job needs to be to try to guide them. But if you're trying to stop it, you might end up getting hurt yourself. So I, I think you want to think more about, again, if you can really be paying attention and be aware, your goal is to catch it before they're fully gaining momentum and going down. So if you can catch it sooner, if your hands in place on their shoulder and on that gate belt, and you can react sooner, then you'll be more likely to get them to recover where you don't have to lower them onto the ground. Um, if you do have to lower them down, what we'll usually recommend is think about if you're to the side and behind them, lowering them onto your knee, and then you can lower them onto the ground from there. So trying to kind of catch them onto your knee um, as a, to kind of slow that momentum down and then lowering them onto the ground that way. That's, that's great. I know that a lot of us that are watching who are caregivers, we've had this experience before. Mm -hmm. and it's scary. It's very scary. And, you know, if we know that our loved one is a fall risk and, you know, every older adult is, mm -hmm. one out of four older adults has a fall every year. And of those, most of them don't come home from the hospital because there are other issues that happen with the fall. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we are thinking ahead of the fact that a fall is going to happen at some point. So we need to be we need to be preventing it as much as we can. And I, and um, I think recognizing those what we call like near falls, you know, is is the person you're caring for starting to have more loss of balance and trips. And, you know, people a lot of times don't think of that as a fall. But if you can start really identifying those and making changes um, whether it's, you know, strengthening or balance or introducing an assistive device, um, then you might be able to really prevent those bigger falls. Um, so that's, that's our goal. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than we can <laughs> than we make it out at times. Right. And, and, you know, um, we want to be prepared uh, mm -hmm. in advance. And that's such a great point that, you know, with, when we're talking about dementia, there are little hints that we start seeing that start making us think, oh, this is something we need to pay attention to. The mm -hmm. same thing with fall prevention, there are, you know, you'll see little hints that make you start thinking, oh, we need to start addressing this. We need to start thinking about this, be prepared for it. And, yeah. and you know, a lot of times we just kind of pass them off as like, oh, that's, you know, that's just a one-time thing, but exactly. maybe, maybe they're not. Maybe. Yeah. Then you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, I did see this, this pattern. Um, but it's hard. You know, most people are doing this for the first time. It's not, you know, it's kind of like you're, um, you know, you, you learn a lot of this, but it's not, um, it's not something you necessarily have life experience in, right? You know, so you're kind of learning as you go and then it keeps changing. It's, um, it, it's tricky. Um, got a question here about a um, loved one who has dementia, uses a walker. Um, it's a, the husband and the wife has trouble transferring them in and out of the bed normally. However, often the husband can find his way into the kitchen in the middle of the night <laughs> the and goes oh, into the refrigerator. Um, is there any suggestions here on how how the wife might be able to better assist on getting the husband in and out of the bed. Um, also had a question referring to that, that um, had the hus uh, this, another person whose husband has Alzheimer's is not able to follow directions very well. Mm -hmm. And so being able to position them 
in first position to be able to transfer them is often an issue. Are there any suggestions on how, how to address when someone is not able to actually understand what you're trying to do and how you're trying to help them? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think what what we tend to rely on is is verbal communication, and that's not necessarily gonna gonna work with with that population. And I'm not sure if that's what's going on with the the one who can who who's not getting up, who's you're having a hard time getting up, and then he he gets up and goes into the kitchen because yeah, you're already he's having strength. So is it a communication um, consideration? So. I mean, you know, I think some of it can be um, demonstration can be really helpful. Um, so, you know, making sure that you're showing them what you want them to do um, can be helpful. Um, I think, you know, guiding with your hands, um, you know, I think sometimes if you're just verbalizing it, they're, they're just not able to process what you're communicating. So um, kind of demonstrating it and relying on, on more of those um, kind of procedural tasks that are that are still intact um so that's that's what i would guess is going on with the other one too is it's probably a communication issue where he doesn't understand um what you're wanting him to do um, but i know you address this too a lot rob do you have anything to add on that well i think you're absolutely right that for everything that we've discussed today um one of the main features to it is the communication part is helping the person that you're assisting understand what the end goal is and mm -hmm. that you know talking them through it before you actually do it so like i'm going to try if we're going to transfer from um, the wheelchair to the bed you know here's what we're going to do i'm going to take off the rail and then I, you're going to scoot over here and then i'm going to do this and i'm going to stand here and i'm going to lock my legs and so your knees don't move and then we're just going to smooch over so the person understands you know where we're going in this process but a lot of times like you said with someone who has a cognitive issue they can't process that um and it's and it's really difficult for them to be able to visualize steps Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it can also be kind of what Rob was saying, where, you know, you, you know, they may not be understanding what you're saying and they may not be seeing what you're doing if you're outside of their peripheral vision. So there are some great like Alzheimer's 101 classes through the Alzheimer's Association, um, and they'll do a lot of what they call like um, positive approach where they'll teach you how to kind of guide the person that you're working with um, and, and how to use kind of handholds to to really kind of encourage them to do certain movements so um they call it like the positive approach there's an occupational therapist called tifa snow who does a lot with that um, but but they could teach you some of these kind of guiding principles and they'll teach you also you know to make sure that they can visually see you and you're not outside of their you know their 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 line of vision um, and then demonstrating what you what you want them to do and um so, so some of that can be helpful too. So I would look for some of those resources as well. Yeah, Tipa Snow is fantastic. She's a nationally renowned uh, expert in dementia and she has a lot of tremendous videos that are online on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So you can go on YouTube and just search for Tipa spelled T-E-E-P-A Snow, just like snow coming out of the sky. Mm -hmm. And look for her videos because there's a uh, wonderful uh, videos where she talks about how to do a lot of these things and the one thing is to remember you know we were talking about the peripheral is to be sure you're standing in front of the loved one and you're at eye level with them when you're talking to them because otherwise they may not understand that you're actually saying things to them uh, another person said that uh, flashcards also can work well if you've got pictures on them that you can show the picture of what it's, what's going to happen that 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 helps a lot as well yeah that's a good recommendation and you guys also don't forget um speech language pathologists um they they focus on on helping with communication and so if you have a loved one that you're really struggling to figure out how to communicate with due to dementia or alzheimer's they can help you with strategies with that, so again, using, um, you know, I think we, we tend to get a lot of orders for physical therapy, but a lot of times um, speech therapy, um, we don't really see until people are having problems with swallowing, but you can also 
um, request home health services with a speech therapist to help you figure out how to how to communicate. And um, they'll do a lot of kind of cognitive tests and, and figure out what might work best. Right. And circling about back around to what you were saying earlier, support groups are mm-hmm. a great place because you'll you'll find other caregivers who are going through the exact same issue that you are. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a great way of sharing best practices and resources. And, you know, hey, I had the same thing. I found that doing this helps. And so exactly. those are a great way to learn new things, but also most importantly for your own self-health, which we've been talking about as well, is that you you need to take care of yourself and being able to mm-hmm. unpack everything that's going on in your world with a bunch of other folks that are going to empathize with you completely. We've got one, time for one more very quick question. Um, all, when we're talking about the therapist and uh, occupational therapist and all of those things, getting that kind of assistance. The question is, can you request those services yourself or do you need to have a doctor's referral? Um, You will tend to need a doctor's referral um, eventually, at least sometimes they can get the the care started. Um, But what you can do is you can also, if you know of a home health agency that you're interested in, you could also contact them. And a lot of times, um, they'll they'll take care of that for you. So they'll reach out to the doctor to get the paperwork. Um, there are usually requirements that they've had to see the doctor within a certain amount of time. Um, so if they haven't, they might say, you need to go in and, and see your doctor. Um, so, but sometimes the doctor will will send that paperwork over and sometimes they'll reach reach out to the doctor and get it for you. Um, so you can you can kind of try it either way. Yeah. Whenever in doubt, check with your doctor's office because if it's co- going to be paid for by the insurance and covered by insurance, you want to have the doctor's referrals so that there's that paper trail there for insurance to pay for it. <laughs> Dr. Walters, thank you so much for joining yeah. us today. We appreciate you taking time out of your classes and your teaching to share all these great resources and information with us. Uh, for those of you who joined us today, we thank you for taking it time out of your day in your caregiving journey. Uh, we always want to remind you that you are never alone in your caregiver journey, that Age of Central Texas is here to help you along with all these other great organizations throughout the area. All you have to do is ask because that's why we exist. We're here to provide you with the help. And always remember there is never, ever any shame in asking for help because all of us will need it at some point in our life. And that's why we're here. So be sure and reach out to us if we can assist you anywhere in your journey. Tomorrow, we're going to wrap up our caregiver training camp. We're going to talk about the caregiver playbook. We have created an actual physical playbook for you with a lot of great resources. And Natalie Alcorder from Age of Central Texas is going to walk you through how to find resources, how to access them, and how to know which ones are actually good resources and ones that are scams. So... We thank you, Dr. Walters, once again for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for, for having me. And we hope that and you thank you guys for all you do. Yes, thank you. Y'all have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.